really my distinct pleasure and honor to have Philip here today. He's been our fearless leader of the COVID crisis group. He is going to lead off our event today or his discussion with uh, a number of remarks, and then we'll enter into a, uh, I'll moderate some questions just to get things started and really would encourage both the audience here in the room with us, thank you for being here and all of you online with us, uh, to have questions ready. Um, this book was meant to be accessible, it was meant to be engaging, it was meant to be provocative. And while it provides some insights and answers, so many questions remain. So we look forward to hearing your questions later. Philip floor is yours. Thank you, Monique. I'm just gonna start first of all with a little remark about what is this COVID crisis group? You know, and who made you, you know, kings and queens of the world? Uh, we were originally created a couple of years ago uh, by a group of four foundations. Um, at the end of 2020, actually, a group of foundations, uh, well, actually a group of people, many of them veterans of the, pre of the PCAST, the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology in the Obama years, um, were all assuming that there was going to be a national COVID commission. Um, and so they wondered how that would be set up and how that would work. And they asked me if I would talk to them. And I did, and they got very excited by the talk. And they said, well, then let's create a planning group right now to get this commission ready. We want you to direct it. Four foundations, ideologically diverse, will fund it. Eric Schmidt's foundation, Rockefeller Foundation, um, a Koch brothers philanthropy called Stand Together and the Skoll Foundation, very ideologically diverse. <laughs> Um, all contributing equal money, all of them having no influence over anything we wrote. Um, and you run this planning group. So we ran this planning group. I then collected, as we got through this, we, we subcontracted with folks to help us. With We stood up task forces. We began holding listening sessions, ultimately, with about 300 people all over including a, a couple of people from MITRE. As we went along too, we also curated uh, a, a, a growing group of people who we identified as, as people we wanted on our planning team. One of them was Monique. Um, just, you know, we, uh, we talked to people that, you know, and then we'd kind of confer. It's kind of like those scenes in the Magnificent Seven where they ride through town and spot this guy in this, oh, would you like to come with us to this Mexican village? Where, <laughs> okay, yes. So that's what is this Monique and, and others, ultimately about 34 people. Um, so hundreds of listening sessions, with all of which we made notes on, multiple task forces, lots of research, uh, work plans, and, and so on. And then uh, last year we realized, you know, there's not gonna be a national COVID commission. There's reasons for that. I've been in touch with the Biden administration. I didn't, I, we concluded it was not gonna happen. And then at that point we had a choice to make as to whether just hang it up. So, well, that was a you know, nice try. And actually I was a little more inclined to just, oh well, uh, shrug my shoulders. And we, the, we held town meetings of the group, Monique may remember this. And the group kind of like, well, damn, damn it. <laughs> we actually think we have a take on this that is not out there. And we have a lot to say. And if there's not gonna be a commission, we should just go ahead and write our own report and say it. Hence the book that a few of you have in front of you on the table. So that's what the COVID crisis group is. It was a COVID commission planning group. Now it's a COVID crisis group that's produced this report that I must say is probably more forthright, concise and plain spoken than a commission report would or could be. Uh, we, uh, our, our members were not appointed by Chuck Schumer and Kevin McCarthy. Um, all right. So that's kind of who we were. Um, I'm really looking forward though to talking to this particular group and I'm not gonna give you folks the same talk I give about this book to other groups. I'm not gonna use my stock slides. I'm not gonna use any slides at all. Um, Cause this is a different kind of group and I really wanna talk a little bit about the challenge of governance right now in this period of history. So one of the members of our group told, tells a story. He's named Rob Rodriguez. He's an emergency medicine physician. And he points out, he teaches emergency medicine at UCSF. So he points out that when a, a common uh, condition in chest trauma is a punctured lung. People present in this situation often 
with an extremely dangerous condition that's called pneumothorax. What happens then is uh, there's a punctured lung, air is going into the pleural cavity, it has no place to go. Uh, and you, as the more you breathe, the more it hurts and, this, and the faster you die. And you can die pretty fast from this. It's, uh, it's really bad. And so what the only way to, one of the ways, to, standard ways to treat this, when this presents in an emergency situation, is you've got a doctor who's trained to recognize the symptoms of this, and then is also trained basically to take a needle and hammer that needle into the chest cavity. This is not a gentle motion. Um, in order to then let the air out, basically, and give you a chance of saving the patient. So in a way, what happened in 2020 is America confronted a huge uh, national emergency. And when you're confronted with that emergency, um, like if that patient comes into that ER turning blue and gasping and in great pain, it, you know, it doesn't do to say, boy, do we have the science on pneumothorax. Here is the book of emergency medicine. <laughs> If you'll quickly look up what to do, right, so you can have fantastic science on pneumothorax, but in that, in that, in those five minutes, that book doesn't help you. Nor is it a lot of help if that patient presents and the patient's husband says, um, here's a hundred thousand dollars if you will save the pay, if you will save uh, my wife uh, or my husband. Great, I, I, I'd love to have the money. <laughs> Tell me what to do. Um, see, if you don't know what to do, it's not like, and by the way, it's not like, gee, somewhere in this chest, I ought to punch a needle. Yeah, I have to know where, because there are actually some sensitive spots there. Right. And you have, so it's, you have to know what to do. You have to, you have to be trained to do it. You have to have the equipment to do it. If you don't have those things in that moment, that person's gonna die. That's actually a pretty good metaphor for what it means to be prepared. In a way, if people, I, people ask like, can you summarize the lessons of this book kind of in a sentence? And I say, yes, it's about preparedness, period. Well, what do you mean by that? Well, the book is really a whole book of exactly what it, preparedness means. It's not about science. It's not about money. It's about knowing what to do and being ready and able to do it. It's very operational, which is actually not a premier culture of governance uh, in American society today. And that's actually the big point I wanna call out for this group. What the COVID emergency exposed incredibly dramatically and vividly all over the country was a tremendous crisis in the fragility and weakness of American civilian government in this age. I think American civilian governance is really deeply challenged right now. And this crisis simply exposed that. It actually overwhelmed civilian governance uh, at all levels. And what you saw during the crisis then was a whole series of frantic improvisations, oftentimes inventing all sorts of forms of ad hoc governance to try to cope. We ended up doing much worse, by the way, than, all, than pretty much all other affluent countries. Um, we didn't do as badly as Russia or Peru. But you know, when we have some numbers on this that are properly, age, if you do this and it's age adjusted, it's the key adjustment you need to make demographically for COVID. Um, and you compare us, uh, and you look at excess mortality, not COVID numbers, and you compare us, say, to the, the best data set we have for Europe is what's called the Euromomo uh, data set, a European mortality data set across about 20 countries, 300 or so million, very diverse societies. Um, you'll, and, it's, and it's age adjusted. We do, America does about 40% worse in excess mortality overall during the crisis. That's a lot. You know, in our case, since we suffered 1.2 million excess deaths, you know, we're talking about numbers that get you around, say, half a million deaths, premature deaths, 
over what would have been expected if we had performed kind of at the European median, not the best cases in Europe. Actually, if you then break it down and don't do the age adjustments, compare, say, Florida to Spain. Spain did 50% better in excess mortality. So there's some, uh, and if you actually even do Florida and Italy. So I'm not picking these kind of stereotypical efficient countries. Um, most people don't think of, you know, models of civilian government efficiency. Oh, oh yes, Italy. Uh, but, right, you see these compare, the comparisons are still striking. They're, by the way, striking at all phases of the crisis. So the numbers change. So there's, you know, if you cut it up by time periods in the crisis. So general crisis in civilian governments at all levels. This exposes itself in a variety of ways, but the main thing about it is, yeah, people have programs and they spend money, but when they actually have to do things, do they know what to do and are they ready and able to do it? And over and over and over, the answer was no and no. So you can start actually from, the book covers everything from warning to warp speed. You can start with uh, in prevention and warning. We discussed the origins issue. I think we have as dispassionate and reliable an account of the available evidence as you can readily find. We don't come down hard on either of the major theories, um, zoonosis or research process. I think we, you know, we kind of highlight the pros and cons of each. Uh, but then we say it's obvious there are these two agendas for the future either way. One is uh, your sentinel surveillance for intelligence and war. Um, well, the old system relied on basically countries overseas to report breakouts under international health regulations, which is a system, a, a vision that decisively failed. So you need, I need a new vision. So what's that? So then we make an argument about how to set up sentinel surveillance, especially uh, focused on the crossover to humans. There are some other theories having to do with combing jungles and bat caves that we didn't find to be so hot from a risk benefit point of view. So uh, then what would, what would be involved in setting up such a system? And we get into that a little bit. It's not actually rocket science. It's just kind of you know, knocking it down and working it. This issue of biomedical surveillance comes up again and again in our book. And then the other piece of it is you've got to tackle the issues of biosecurity and biosafety, uh, given the level of biological engineering that's really just become possible in the last 10 years. Have to, just have to do. There are forms of recombinant DNA research that are genuinely worrisome. Uh, we're just beginning to figure out how to establish a risk-benefit calculus and figure out how to even begin reviewing that research. There are global challenges. I don't actually think these are impossible challenges, but they're hard. Uh, and they start being hard actually in the virology community, which has no interest in any such constraints. So you start there with kind of what to do and how to do it right at the levels of warning and biosecurity and biosafety. Then you move from there to kind of the outer range of defenses of containment. You try to keep the thing from coming in, notice it's coming in, to your country, notice something's coming, and then what to do about it. Right away, we were overwhelmed. Um, we were overwhelmed in our ability to track the arrival and spread of the virus and know where it was. By the way, much worse at that than a variety of other societies. And actually there are parts of MITRE that were engaged a little bit in trying to work on some of these issues. Then when it came to things like testing, of course, uh, even once we had the diagnostic test, um, which um, CDC actually developed its original diagnostic test very quickly, then they screwed up the design, and then they had no real plan for production at scale or for processing test results at scale. Um, they had, they had uh, when it came to travel regulations and travel restrictions, they're prepared for very <sighs> boutique things, but once they were confronting a big problem, they were instantly overwhelmed, and then you're just and uh, don't know what to do. Um, but one interesting point about testing in, uh, is everybody knows, everyone in this room knows there was a problem in having enough tests. Everyone's heard, heard that story, and that's right. That's actually, but in a way, that doesn't really get you at the heart of the problem. And yes, there are things you could try to do, so next time we'd have a jillion tests. 
But you know what? In this crisis, if we'd had a million tests, we actually had no plan for what to do with them. We didn't know what to do. So as soon as you start having a lot of tests, all sorts of questions arise. Okay, here are the following uh, claims on tests. What? Do you, are we going to use these tests for biomedical surveillance all over the country um, in order to track the progress of the disease? Or two, are we going to use this in order to provide point of care protection at nursing homes, places that employ essential workers, schools, you know, in, or, in order to protect the vulnerable or otherwise control? That's a design for how to use tests. Or three, uh, Let's use the tests instead to provide drive-through test centers, um, you know, 10,000 drive-through test centers so that anxious Americans all over the country can find out if they're sick um, and, and so on. And then, by the way, for each of those claims, then you can see there'd be a whole protocol for how you use the tests. There would be a whole design and deployment. Then you'd want to coordinate your FDA approvals so that you had FDA approvals that were lined up with the, with the planned use. And then it also was lined up with the financing so that you could do all of this at scale. The point is, as soon as you kind of think about this for a minute, you realize that I can have a million tests in a warehouse. But if I haven't done all this other work of exactly what I do with the tests, um, it doesn't matter if I have them in the warehouse. And actually, that's uh, a lot of that is what began to happen in the second half of 2020 and then on into 2021. Uh, we began solving the problem of production at scale. We began deploying rapid antigen tests. But unless you do this other work, it doesn't help. You move then from the containment phase and its failures to the problems of you know, the system as a whole. And uh, we don't have a national public health agency in America. We don't. People thought, and even people at the CDC thought that the CDC was a national public health agency. <clears throat> Operationally, it is not. It has no executive uh, authority in the federal government to drive the overall response. It has no operational capability in the states, and it has no executive authority in the states. It can't really tell anybody what to do. It was actually a research institution. Most people we talked to kind of characterize it as a sort of public health university with various disciplinary departments. And um, so what do we do? And no one knew. It's like in the free containment phase, uh, what's happening actually during February of 2020 is mainly, the, and it's driving the CDC people crazy because actually they want to be given guidance about what to do, what one person called strategic level governance, and what they're getting instead are endless discussions day after day of what to do with cruise ship passengers, which is consuming like NSC meetings all day long. You know, how do we evacuate and quarantine cruise ship passengers, which one person analogized to, you know, the fire department arriving at a fire at a six story building, and all the firefighters are concentrating on saving the kitty cat on the third floor, even though there are a thousand people in the building. So then you move to the, the wider issues of national crisis management, which collapsed in America in April and May of 2020. Federal crisis management collapsed and was simply, and actually almost consciously abandoned. And then just like, all you stay in localities, you're pretty much on your own. Feet. And at the federal level, no one knew who was in charge. No one had defined roles and missions among all sorts of different entities that we described. And by the way, to this day, that the issues of who's in charge and the definition of roles and missions is not, has not been addressed uh, really any better than it was at the outset of the pandemic. But then you move to those uh, state, and local state and local governance. And here is one of the places where the crisis of civilian governance in America really becomes evident. Of course, the public health departments were almost invariably immediately overwhelmed. So the pattern we saw over and over again was the creation of ad hoc governance structures, often set up by governors, often using you know, business leaders they knew, reaching out to experts if they had them at Metro Medical Centers to, you know, to volunteer medical advice, and then just cobbling together some places better than others, some states better than others, it's all over the place. But one of the things you immediately notice, and this is a symptom of the governance crisis, is in 
this was the best year for consulting firms in their modern history. I was talking with a partner at McKinsey about this last night. He said, like, at, for us at McKinsey, you know, it's like this incredible spike. McKinsey had uh, the best business in its history in 2020 and 2021, like by, by, by multiples. They, they literally, they completely overwhelmed their staffing. They couldn't bring people into McKinsey fast enough. And there's a version of this for BCG and a version of this for Bain. Because what's happening is the consulting firms and MITRE, there are probably one or two people at MITRE who are distantly aware of parts of this story. Um, what was happening is the, they couldn't do governance. They weren't calling in the consulting firms to critique how they were doing. They were calling in the consulting firms to actually do the work itself, do the governance work itself. Would you please set up a crisis management operation for me? Would you please staff the governor? Would you please tell us what to do? I mean, the policy making and organization functions were basically outsourced to these consulting firms. And that's why there was this gigantic spike in demand at all levels, right up to Alex Azar's office in HHS with BCG writing his slides for the meeting he'd have proposing warp speed to Jared Kushner. So this is when you see that when you meet an emergency that actually civilian uh, federal crisis management collapses and that the state and local level uh, their ability to handle this themselves also collapses and that they then start desperately hiring private consulting firms to carry out the governance functions for them. I think it's fair to say that that would be a flashing red light. You move then on to the healthcare system, which had no surge capacity because it was just in time inventories, very efficient. And, and we have a very good chapter about the healthcare system, which the COVID crisis really pushed the healthcare system into a crisis from which it is still spiraling down. Um, it's actually in really grave condition right now. The, the canary in the coal mine is the nursing crisis, which is now afflicting the major uh, metro medical centers, even places like MGH in Boston and others. Um, it's just a, becoming a really serious problem but it's, it surfaced a, a wider issue then. Is that the, you know, the governance of the healthcare system, as probably some of you know, is quite detached from the governance of public health, which in turn is quite detached from the whole governance of the biopharma industrial complex. And there's no orchestra in that. So the healthcare system pushed into a crisis from which it is not recovered and is still moving downward. Then you move to the breakdown of trust and confidence, as of course people begin to realize that they don't, uh, the government is flailing, they don't know what to do, and therefore all the toxic politics can really flow in and explode. And then what Monique helped us so much on is the biopharma industrial complex and the management of that. And the governance of that was improvised, sometimes outstandingly in warp speed. And our report has, I think, the best discussion that you'll find in print of the origins of warp speed in both its strengths and weaknesses, but also the absence of a warp speed for drugs and therapeutics and some other issues. But the whole concept of you need to have been prepared in peacetime if you wanted to have this industrial complex work for you in wartime. So the net then of this whole story that I just wanted to introduce is one of, this is a crisis that beyond your interest in healthcare, it's a crisis that really exposed a general weakness and fragility in the civilian governance of the United States. And it's those broad issues that I think MITRE is trying in a bunch of different ways to address. Wow, we've got a lot to talk about. <laughs> You have uh, set the table beautifully, Philip. Thank you. Um, one of the things I want to touch on initially, again, the framing of what we've all just lived through um, as a war, as the COVID war. And so the question is, if, if this is war, who are the warriors? Um, in missile defense, we, we count on a professional class and their tools and technologies to protect us <laughs> from an incoming nuclear threat. For these biological threats, 
the incoming, present, growing, moving, changing. And arguably, 8 billion people on the planet, 330 million people in this country, were the warriors that had to figure out what their bio shield would be. Right. Their home, a mask, a test to give them situational awareness, a vaccine. How would you sort of put this into context? The challenges, not only as you mentioned with the fragility of our US civilian governance, but the role that individuals play in this type of a war? Well, it's, um, that's a great way of putting it. Uh, in this war, when, when the intermediaries who you trust to provide you with your security break down, then it's every community and then every individual on their own. This is, by the way, true in cybersecurity too, um, and, some, and some other areas. And then the way people will respond to that will often, you will not like the way they will respond to it. Um, because they get anxious and scared and angry, and that uh, and takes a lot of different forms. Um, I think it's therefore really important to build up intermediaries that work in partnership with the individuals and that uh, reach out to the individuals and are close to, are close to them. So for what, for example, this manifests itself in a lot of ways. For instance, America, as some of you may know, doesn't really have much of a community health workforce, which is very common in many other countries. A community health workforce, these are usually sort of uh, paramedical people. They're not doctors. They're volunteers or uh, uh, part-time nurses who are the bridge between the mainline healthcare system and coming to you in your home. And they do this with prenatal visits and a lot of other things. America never built such institutions to do that bridging function. So a lot of people actually feel alienated and isolated from the healthcare system. We have a community health workforce if you live in a federally qualified health district, which by design is limited to cover only medical certified medically underserved areas, which encompass only about 9% of the American population. So that, that system, which by the way, works rather well, uh, is no threat to the mainstream health proprietary healthcare system. And that people who, who are community health workers on Navajo reservations and such are not regarded as high status for you know, coming to suburban homes because they only do work in these peripheral low status places. That's just, an, just one illustration of what happens when the intermediaries either are isolated, break down, and they don't make connections with individuals to make them feel safe and make them see how to use the partnership with the intermediaries. There's a version of this for how you promote vaccine uptake for uh, a, a lot of different security functions. I, you know that your society breaks down when all the individuals themselves have to just defend their homes on their own. I'm gonna ask a couple more questions and open up to the floor. So give a, give a heads up to the floor and, and the online one. Um, you've been a leader, uh, a diplomat, an advisor to national security advisors, uh, leaders of the State Department in the national security enterprise. Uh, a leader of the 9-11 Commission. Um, one of the things I've struggled with and we talked quite a bit about, you know, is this a health issue or is this a national security issue? Um, a lot of concern, uh, years, decades of experience now, it tends to be neither and fall through the cracks. It's not a priority for health. It's not a priority for national security. It is, it is health security and it it really hasn't found a home. It found, hasn't found a champion. It hasn't found investments commensurate, <clears throat> arguably with, again, what we've just seen, the devastation, the loss of lives, livelihoods, businesses, uh, significant hit to the GDP, the financial impact, $5 trillion in direct federal expenditures. What is your sense of moving forward, what leadership looks like at, at a federal level, at a national level, how can we do better? Well, I think we're in a period, this is crisis is a little bit of a wake up call of a transition to a new way of thinking of public problems. 
Um, I, as you say, I've spent a lot of time in national security world. My friends in national security world almost have no idea about what this COVID report is about and wouldn't recognize almost anyone on the back cover. And like, like what, you know, biologists? So there's like this world I was in for this report, I barely communicates with that, with that world. Meanwhile, I ran an election reform commission after the Florida debacle of 2000 that was actually quite successful in updating the American election system for that generation. And, but the people in health world and national security world don't know anything about that wor world and that work. I was an elected member of a town school board, but to, I just kind of drift through the, and worked in the criminal justice system. So I drift through these different spheres and they're all isolated. But, so here's a big point for this group. And MITRE is in a position actually to see this. Some, a lot of you see this is we used to have some fairly easy kind of silos about where we classified our problems. Like for instance, between foreign and domestic. In the 21st century, and I think this began becoming true in the late 20th century, but for sure in the 21st century, these silos just really don't work very well anymore. Um, problems that may seem foreign like energy and environment, global capitalism, um, digital revolution and its issues, biological revolution and its issues. These, uh, these are transnational problems on a very large scale. They present in home communities as domestic problems, almost invariably, and, uh, and arouse domestic political reactions, but almost all the solution sets are transnational. This tells you right away that Gee, the compartmentation of these into foreign and domestic is just intellectually and analytically unworkable for the problem solving or even for the analysis of the diagnosis of the problem. This COVID crisis is a really good example of this. This is a global war, required a global coalition and a global strategy, which we didn't, did not adequately develop and uh, paid a heavy price. We frantically improvised something like COVAX right in the heart of the crisis, an international organization built overnight, which probably actually saved millions of lives. Because, you know, frankly, it's a lot of really good people came together and put it together and it ended up giving out 2 billion vaccine doses. Uh, but, you know, so international organization can work, but it's, you have to reconceptualize these things. So. We're trying to break down these barriers. There is a sense too in which I have to call everything national security in order to get people in DOD to pay attention to it and get DOD style funding for it. <laughs> this is of course a very dangerous pathology because it, it's part of the general over militarization of those parts of American governance that remain effective, which makes it more and more praetorian. I mean, in this crisis, the one really successful operational program at the national level had to be turned over to the Department of Defense, which was warp speed. And then it was sheltered in part from the chaos and cronyism of the rest of the Trump administration by Esper and Miller. Um, this is not a model for like how we should go forward. But then when we made our recommendations that we need to build up a capability in HHS, for example, the reaction including in our group was, you can't let HHS work this. You know, they, you know, they can't operate their way out of a paper bag. And there's, a, I'll, I'll say, there are jaundiced impressions of the quality of, of policy work that's done at the top of HHS. I think actually those impressions have some merit. But the answer to that can't be that, well, let's just give up on HHS and give it to the Pentagon. Um, then that inspires you to think, well, we need a different kind of HHS and a different kind of HHS secretariat and a different kind of HHS leadership than what we've got now, because they need to see that what governance requires in this age isn't, isn't about performative theatrics and establishing programs that transfer money with uh, inattention to the operational culture of actually doing stuff. Well said. I'm gonna open it up to the floor. Um, anyone in line? Uh, I'm sorry, in the room? Questions? 
We have a question from Dr. Kunal Rambia. Welcome, Kunal. Thank you. Um, Dr. Zelico, Dr. Mansura, thanks for this uh, event. And I had the pleasure of being there at the National Academies of Book Launch as well. So um, the timeliness of this is incredibly important. There's a lot of revisionist history happening right now um, in terms of what happened over the past three years. Um, but also the, the cycle, the election cycle that we're about to go through, um, the magnitude of changes that are referred to in the book and that are referred to in this conversation that are necessary to not do this again um, seem too hard to overcome in the political context that we have and, and in, the, um, in the willingness to put this behind us as the emergency has expired. So I was wondering, um, what hope do we have What's the what's the rosy picture here? Because I, I tend to be cynical, but I, I want to hear from you all about, you know, what what truly uh, what where is the hope? Where's the silver lining? Um, it's uh, a lot of the press I talk to are hang around Washington politicians so much. They, too, are very cynical and depressed. Uh, so I get this sort of question a lot. And you folks are adults. Uh, I, I can't kind of buy you off with Pollyanna Pablum. Um, here's, but what I can say is, is, is actually uh, truthful and historically informed is that American history tends not to run just on linear lines. There tend to be pendulums that swing and things that go back and forth. And just when you think things are definitely going in one direction, they shift into another. Because um, what happens is people react to trends. They, now, they don't necessarily react in ways you like, but they react. The country has been through very, some periods of very grave social and management crises before. Um, this, I, I think this is a period of tumultuous change and the country is very polarized. Is it more polarized than it was in 1910? I'm not sure, actually. Uh, in 1912 election, you had four major political parties uh, who hated each other, and the country was profoundly polarized. There was widespread labor violence and unrest, um, all sorts of upheavals that actually extended on into the early to mid-1920s. Um, the, the surge of the Klan, I mean, lots of things. So immigration at the end, all mass immigration into the United States in the early 1920s, which lasted for 50 years. So a lot of things uh, going on in society before. What we need to, though, what Americans want is actually Americans do want government to do stuff for them. They actually do want a somewhat functional government. And when you get a crisis like this, it's very important then is to how people talk about a crisis like this. That's why we wrote this book. Is uh, No one can read this book and not come away thinking, oh, there's actually a lot of stuff you can do to fix these things. You don't actually have to have like some giant omnibus bill passed through Congress that creates some enormous new federal agency that's a utopian dream. You can go through this chapter by chapter and you see stuff that's actually doable by human beings, including people that even hear it in my ear, um, on one or two points that actually one or two people are working on. So then it becomes, this is on human scale. You do need a cultural change in which people begin to insist more on getting stuff done and less on the performative theatrics. If they think that government and the federal government in particular is just a theater stage that just doesn't matter except for the characters you root for in the culture wars, that's, a, that's gonna be very damaging to governance. And this is true by the way it now more and more at the state level. State governance is breaking down in many states across the countries. And this is a bipartisan comment. So to reverse that is going to require a cultural shift in which more and more people demand and act upon, including business leaders and others like, you know, we, we actually need people who will like get stuff done and who are competent. And you can find bright spots all over the place where there are such people and there are such cultural pushes. So the question then, and it's an open question, is whether the general culture and demand of what we want is going to shift back, as it has in other periods, more towards, you know, like, come, we need doers and not blusterers. Um, I haven't given up on the possibility of that. Thank you, Philip. Uh -huh. Joe, question from the yeah, virtual Joe, audience. Is this done? 
Joe, is Joe Kennedy, I've got a couple of questions from the chat function. Uh, the first one by Harry Hanna is, uh, how do we promote international cooperation in monitoring response, as well as cooperation in vaccine distribution, when every country has its own incentives, its own uh, incentive to act in its own interests? And the answer is you have to, their interests have to coincide with ours or complement ours. So let me give you a very concrete illustration of what I mean by that. Because this is a group of people who do practical operational work on their good days. So uh, for instance, let's suppose I wanted to, uh, to improve the quality of our sentinel surveillance in Indonesia or Vietnam, which is not, not a, those would not be bad places to start. Um, and then what we want is we might want CDC people who are tracking outbreaks and infectious diseases and other things. But we might go to them and say, uh, this is what we need, but here are some things you need and why this would be useful to you. You might need gene sequencers in your hospitals and people and, and talent to, who can interpret all of that. You might need stuff in your own medical facilities that help you track disease trends of a, of, an, of a common nature in your own country and help you allocate your medical resources. You might want reassurance that if we get a gene sequence of interest to us, that you have access to that gene sequence at the, at the same time we have access to that gene sequence. And then we can work out some kind of IP thing if someone wants to sell that gene sequence to Pfizer. <laughs> um, I mean, when you break it down to that level of problem, and that so can we figure out a way to work that deal with Vietnam and Indonesia? Hard, but I don't think that's impossible. Can we then train cadres of Americans and improve the quality of CDC back to actually a little bit what it was so that there are Americans who are helping to do that work? I think that is possible. Um, but you can, you can then imagine a network of sentinel surveillance uh, that actually also builds a lot of positive relations in the place that's actually been a highlight in this crisis, where we got our good information all through this crisis, it wasn't because our intelligence agencies worked. They were not helpful in this, in giving us a warning on this, and they know it. Where it worked was actually informal networks of scientists and doctors, kind of the white coat diplomacy. All the, uh, the initial clues of information on what was going on radiated out of that network. Okay, so let's build out that network. So another one from Eric Akers. Uh, to what extent do you think this is a need for new laws and programs or just for better leadership of the existing system? And, and I'll add one thing. Uh, what should be the first step in preparing for the future? I do think um, I would start with leadership before laws and programs. But when I talk, leadership is such an amorphous and opaque concept, right? So, we need better leadership, he sonorously burbled. <laughs> no, no. Like, again, you folks, right, you got, you get it. Um, but you see I'm articulating a fairly distinct vision that has to do with operational readiness. But when you open the door of operational readiness, it actually requires some really serious analytical work on what you want to be able to do what then are the concrete requirements then to be able to do those things? And then, you know, doing all the, then when you do that work on problem after problem after problem, including the ones here, what I think you'll find is, actually there are a lot of latent legal authorities and a lot of latent capabilities that actually, if they were animated by the right kind of driving visions on these specific points, actually could get quite a lot done. You might find then, oh yeah, in the, in the renewal of PAPA, the Pandemic All Hazardous, All Hazards Preparedness Act, I know an acronym on all of your fingertips, but if you do that, oh, well, maybe I need to tweak this or that authority, you know, it's CMS and Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services or something like that. And yes, there are some particular things here and there, yes, but I don't think this is uh, like a $100 billion program. Even the, the vaccine readiness initiatives that our friends and group members at CEPI, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovation, CEPI, really great group in London, based, based in London. Um, 
they have a readiness initiative that would cost billions of dollars, but it's not tens of billions of dollars. And it would be very, and it could get you a level of preparedness and they're being very concrete and operational to get us ready to manufacture at scale. It's not primarily an R&D program. It's an R&D program designed to ready manufacturing at scale in different kinds of public private partnerships. So you, you can kind of see the point that I'm emphasizing here, leadership vision. If all you do is pour more money into the old vessels of the old programs and processes without that vision, well, A, I don't think you can persuade Congress to do it because those old vessels are discredited. But B, I'm not sure that it would solve the problem well. If, however, you were animated by a leadership vision that explained what we want to do and how to do it, actually, I think the investments are attainable. Question from Dr. Cynthia Hansen. Cynthia, welcome. Hi, thank you so much for your uh, succinct analysis <laughs> after, I know, thousands of hours of work. Um, okay, so I know Dr. Mansura from our work at ASPR, and I was deep into preparedness at ASPR. And I will tell you that we had some extraordinary successes um, at being more prepared than we were over time, which is invisible to the public. When things don't happen, who knows, right? So how do you make preparedness visible for the things that don't happen, that, the, that governance has protected the public from in a way that, that makes these lessons become meaningful and observable to, uh, to indicate progress for the nation and inspire hope in the future? But usually a, a good guide on this um, is you seldom do things in wartime that you don't practice in peacetime. And so when you practice things in peacetime and even do low level things in peacetime, then that gets noticed. And it's a way of exercising your wartime capabilities on smaller scales. So in, to take the example you, you offer, and actually Asper is the history of Asper, which we go into in our report, is, is actually um, a, was in, is, is, this is a new organization. This is less than 20 years old. It was created in, uh, in the aftermath of the anthrax scares and a desire to enhance our preparedness. On your testimony, well, it, that, was, that was a good step. So now in a way we're saying yes, and now it's time for some next steps. But then you're saying, how do we spotlight what we do that's good? Um, and the, I think the answer to that is, is you've got to be doing things that are helpful to people, as I say, in peacetime. Now, then you, then you say, well, how could we possibly do that? Like if we're stockpiling 500 million N95 masks, how could we possibly make that useful to anyone in peacetime? Well, I could think of one or two ways. If you've got warehouses of N95 masks, I think I, I could think of some ways that you could uh, display that to a few folks in peacetime. I mean, for, for example, and there are other things that you can do sort of on the, on the publicity side, but as long as ASPR remains an acronym that no one has heard of except the Cognoscenti, and if half the people in this room don't know what ASPR stands for, or even what, what the, that's ASPR, by the way, for the uninitiated, um, you, then you see what I mean. Exactly. And that's a little bit why we're making this argument that the policy role here needs to be elevated within HHS. The public thinks of HHS basically as a giant welfare department. It's a giant income transfer mechanism. It's not really a policy department. And actually that shows in some of the people that are put into the top jobs. Thank I know you. we just have a minute left. Um, I want to take this opportunity to really uh, extend my gratitude, Philip. Uh, your convening of this group, I, I think doing just what Cynthia requested, shining the light on the successes, on the heroes, uh, while improvisational, um, extraordinary. And we want to capture those. We want to make sure those are built upon, whether it was a federal agency, state and local public health official, um, or an individual or, um, or corporation that stepped up. Um, 
This book captures that. You're giving through your leadership and this COVID crisis group a 34 dimensional view of what happened, what we've all just lived through and what we need to be prepared for going forward. So with extraordinary gratitude to you for what you've done in your leadership of this book, um, again, I am hopeful uh, because I know the fierce dedication uh, of my co-authors, of many of my colleagues here in the room at MITRE and the work that we do every day, and many others out there that are committed to ensure we do better and knowing that there are events that lie ahead that we need to be prepared for. So, You folks are one of the seed beds for the agenda I talked about today. You're not the only one, but you're one of them. Please join me in thanking Philip Zellicott for joining us today. <laughs>